In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of Samuel. We are continuing our study in Samuel. And really the only thing that you, you need to know to understand this story, because it's very self-explanatory, the big detail you need to know is that by this point, Samuel is, is getting a little up there. He's been ministering to Judah and to Israel for a long time now, and he's a very well-known prophet. He's kind of, this isn't like an official title or anything, but he's kind of seen as the head prophet of Israel. He's probably the most famous one, the most well-known one. And so he's been in his ministry for a really long time now, and, and people kind of see him almost in the same way as they did Moses. Like I said, Samuel's not the only prophet like Moses was when he was there, but he, he holds a similar level of prestige, and that's really where we start off in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. So let's go ahead and look at that right now. And it came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijai, they were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations." In this little Bible story, and, and this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture because it just speaks so much to the human condition, and we're going to be spending a little bit more time in, in chapter 8 even after today. Did the children of Israel have a legitimate gripe? Oh, yeah. I mean, here you have people that are supposed to be judges, God's representatives to discern judgment between his people on Israel. They are literally representing God. And they're taking bribes and doing all kinds of ill-gotten things. That basically you can buy God's favor. That's the message that Samuel's sons are sending out, and God is not happy with it. So it is absolutely understandable that Israel is very upset with this. There is no way that you can look at that in a positive light. However, here's the follow-up question that a lot of people... Maybe don't ask about this. Did their solution make any sense? Actually, no. Because, and, and it's hilarious that this just happened to coincide with our previous segment where I was talking about a difference in worldviews. You see, their solution didn't match their problem. Their, solution, their problem was there's corrupt people that are corrupting God's system, the system that he put together of judges in Israel, and so we want to get rid of of the judge's system, and we want a king. Now think about this. Their problem is there was a human being that was judging the people that was corruptible. And because they were corruptible, then they said that the system obviously isn't broken. You can't look at a misuse of the system and blame the system itself. Now, if there is some kind of inherent flaw in the system that leads to this or makes it more prone to this, okay, that's a fair argument. But what they're doing here is, is not that. What they're doing here is saying, okay, there are some corrupt judges here, and it's not working in this particular instance, so we want to do away with it, and we, and we want to get, have a king. Now think about this. Judges did have a level of power and influence over Israel. I mean, that's how the system works. They had to have at least somebody that had authority over the people to say, nope, this is right and this is wrong. They had to have some sort of law enforcement in the land which is why the judges were put there in the first place. But what's going on here is they're saying, these people are corrupt and they have a lot of influence over us. Give us somebody with absolute authority over us. What? So you're saying, because people can be corrupted, 
and these two judges are corrupted, now you want me to give you somebody that has absolute authority to tell you to do whatever you want? I mean, literally anything they can tell you to do, you have to comply with? That doesn't make any sense. Because what's to stop a corrupt person from becoming king? And by the way, if you look at Israel's history, that was the norm, not the exception. There's only like maybe half a dozen good kings in the entire Bible. Out of the several dozen, you've got maybe six or seven really good kings, and that's it. And even the good kings, they still had some pretty significant problems with their own corruption, too. And so it's just fascinating to look at this, that their solution to a problem is to put themselves in a position where that problem can be made far, far worse. And their, their solution doesn't make any sense. So the point of all that is, corrupt people abusing a system is not a repudiation on the system itself. And what they were doing was rejecting God. They were rejecting God's plan. They were rejecting his recommendations for them. And we're actually going to see this a little bit later. They didn't want God to be their king. They didn't want God to be their king. They wanted a human being in that position, which is wrong on a number of levels. Sure, yeah, p people screw up who were supposed to be representatives of God all the time. This story is, is a case study in that. But ultimately, there's a difference in having a human being with limited power and a human being with absolute power. Because if he has absolute power, then a corrupt person will do a lot more damage. That's the reason that the judges system was in place. And the thing is, I don't think that it's even possible, because I've, I've done stories on this particular passage of Scripture countless times. And yet, reading it today, I don't think that it's possible to think of a more appropriate Bible story than right now with what we're seeing going on with this virus. There are so many people that are scared and panicked, and they have legitimate gripes. They have legitimate fears. There are things that are going on that are wrong. But their solution doesn't make any sense. Their solution is to empower the same corruptible government, the same corruptible people that put them in those bad positions in the first place and give them even more authority than they had beforehand. It just doesn't make any sense. But it shows how dangerous being in a crowd of people can be. It shows how dangerous groupthink can be. That because a whole bunch of people want it, we feel secure in the herd, and if a bunch of people agree with us, then, well, I mean, how could we be wrong? Look at the way that this reads that the entirety of Israel, it almost seems, it, first of all, it says the elders specifically, but the, the wisest, all of the people of Israel, seemingly the vast, vast majority of them at least is implied, wanted a king and wanted to get rid of the prophets and get rid of the judges system. Because they had corrupt judges, so now they want to judge with even more power than they had before. It, none of that makes sense, but because there were a lot of people that agreed with them, that's what they went with. This is something that is a recurring theme throughout the Old Testament, that the people of Israel ask for something, and they keep asking for it, and they keep asking for it, and they keep asking for it either directly through asking or through their actions, and then eventually, no matter how bad an idea it is, eventually God says, all right, if that's what you want, have at it, and it never ends well for them. Just because a whole bunch of people agree with it doesn't mean it's a good idea. And the way that I've seen people here recently willing to just hand over their freedom as a blank check for people in authority to do whatever they want to with it, even though the very thing that they're complaining about were things that essentially they're put in that position by the same government. They're saying, no, please take my liberties away and do whatever you want to with them. I mean, that's exactly what happened in Israel. They were panicked. They were in a legitimately bad situation. And because of that, they put forth a solution that actually made their situation much worse. And that's really what we see happen with them. You see, when something's not working, change is a good thing. But difference for the sake of difference is never wise. 
if you come up with a solution that is different than the current system that's going on now and it actually is better, then great. I'm all for it. Full steam ahead. But if you see some kind of problem and your solution is, well, let's just do something different, not let's do something that will work better, let's just do something different, that's not a good excuse for changing the system you're under. And unfortunately, for the next several hundred years of biblical history, Israel got a very realistic metaphor on that. They, they, they lived out the consequences of their bad decisions that they made while they were in a panic. I hope that's a lesson for us today. Stay the course, friends. Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't. This is especially true if she's exotic looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman, so now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel, otherwise you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, woke brigade. <laughs>